Hello, I'm Leon Bates. During my 20 years in the Air Force and aerospace electronic work, people who knew that I was a Christian have often asked me, Leon, why do you believe the Bible is God's Word? Well, there are many reasons, of course. Uh, one of them is the fact of millions of changed lives, changed by reading and obeying the Bible. A second one is fulfilled Bible prophecy that was given hundreds of years in advance, like Israel's dispersion and regathering. We'll talk more about that later. But a third proof uh, for logically thinking people is the amazing unity and harmony of the Bible. The fact that it's not just one book, but 66 books written over 1,500 years time in three languages by 40 human writers who, for the most part, did not know each other or what each other was writing, and yet it all fits together in perfect unity and harmony like a hand in a glove. How can that possibly be? The mathematical probability of that happening by chance would be astronomical, and the engineers I work with agreed with me. Well, the answer is given to us in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Yes, 40 human writers, but only one author, the Holy Spirit of God, who directed those 40 writers. Now let's see the Bible's amazing unity and the gifts that God offers us for our joy and for His glory. Here's a brief introduction to the five divisions of this visual presentation. Section number one shows major Old Testament events up to the cross. Section number two shows key events from the cross of Christ to His second coming in glory, and this includes the time we're now living in and many of the future events. Number three shows future events from Christ's second coming to eternity future, and this includes visuals about the final judgments, heaven, hell, and some good news. Number four shows how we can make sure of heaven. What a joy to know with proof that our eternal home is in heaven, and we'll show that proof. Number five is about the Christian life after salvation. This section is to help us have God's very best in our present life on this earth until we graduate to heaven. Now we invite you to enjoy Projection for Survival. Section number one, the creation from the creation to the cross. This chart shows a panoramic view of the Bible from eternity past to eternity future. Now I realize you can't see the details on this chart, but we're going to show you close-up details as we go. It shows how the Old Testament and the New Testament merge together in perfect unity and harmony to make up the Bible God's Word. There are seven ages, or sometimes called dispensations, or divisions in the outworking of God's overall eternal purpose, and we'll see what that is also. Now these are the names that have been given to these divisions by theologians. Innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, grace, and kingdom. In each age, man is given a specific test or responsibility. In each age, most people disobey God, and each age ends in failure. In each age, that failure results in God's divine judgment. The overall revelation of these seven tests show that mankind is utterly sinful and lost. Yet God demonstrates His love in every age, and man's salvation is always by grace alone, through faith alone. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and on the sixth day of that creation week, He created Adam and Eve. Now, they were created perfectly innocent, and for a time they had fellowship with God in that beautiful Garden of Eden. The question is, will they trust God's wisdom and love for them and obey Him in this paradise? Now, God gave them a very simple test. He said, of all the trees of the Garden of Eden you may freely eat, but do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Satan came along in the form of a serpent. He lied to Eve. He said, you'll not die. You'll be like God's knowing good and evil. He mixed truth with lie. It was true they'd gained the knowledge of good and evil, but God said they would die if they disobeyed. Eve was deceived, she ate the forbidden fruit, gave to Adam, and he chose to eat it also, and judgment came. It took several forms. Snakes were cursed to crawl on their belly in the dust of the earth. 
The earth itself was cursed to grow thorns and thistles. Women were cursed to have pain in childbirth. And men were cursed to have to work for their livelihood. And as God said, death did come. Physical death and also spiritual death. Separation from God because a sinner cannot come into the presence of a holy God. That was the fall of man. Mankind fell from fellowship with God due to Adam's sin. Since that day, every human is born with a sinful nature and the curse of death hanging over his head. After man's fellowship with God was broken by Adam's sin, the rest of the Bible reveals God's beautiful plan of redemption for man and the restoration of his fellowship with God. Now God came to visit Adam and Eve after they'd sinned. They had gained the knowledge of good and evil. They knew they were naked, so they tried to hide from God. They also tried to hide their nakedness with fig leaves, the first human efforts to hide sin. Human efforts for salvation are still common today as people hope to earn God's forgiveness. God demonstrated His love and grace for Adam and Eve after they sinned. God clothed them with coats of skins which required animal bloodshed. That was the first picture of the future bloodshed of Christ to pay for our salvation. Now a common teaching of many even highly educated people today is just do what you think is right and that will surely be good enough. Just let your conscience be your guide. Well, in age number two, we learned that conscience alone is not a sufficient guide to bring man to a right relationship with God apart from God's grace. In age number two, they were told to do all known good, abstain from evil, approach God with animal blood sacrifices, which again was a picture foretelling the death of Christ. The wickedness of man was so great in that day, the Bible said the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually, and it even grieved God's heart that he'd even made man on the earth. The judgment of that age number two <clears throat> was the universal flood in Noah's day. But the Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and his family of eight were saved from that judgment in the ark that Noah built for 120 years. Again, God demonstrated his love and grace for the human race by sparing Noah and his family in the ark of safety through the global flood. Age number three is human government. They were given new responsibility after the flood. God told them to multiply and replenish the earth. Under the leadership of Nimrod, they built the Tower of Babel. They said, let's build a city and a tower and make ourselves a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They understood God's command, but they chose to disobey it. That was the Tower of Babel, and God simply confused them by confusing their languages, which is the origin of our many languages in the world to this day. Can you imagine a worker trying to say, hand me a brick, and it came out something like, Abba do baba me thunk a woody? Do you think maybe God has a sense of humor? I think he does. In fact, Psalms 2, 1 to 4 says, God laughs at man's, man's vain efforts against him. Again, God demonstrated his love and grace for the human race by sparing their lives in judgment this time and just confusing their languages. Age number four is called promise, and that was the beginning of Israel as a nation, as a, as, a, as a people. He started dealing with Abraham, whose name was later changed to Abraham. And God gave Abram a conditional promise. They did not obey his directive will, and they missed his best for their lives. In Genesis 12, 1 to 3, God told Abram to go to a land he would show him, and I will make you a great nation, bless you, and make your name great. God also promised through Abram all the families of the earth would be blessed. Well, that's already happened at least two ways. Number one, the Bible came to us through Jewish writers. And number two, the human birth of Christ came through the Jewish race. The Jews are God's chosen people, and He will ultimately be glorified through them. So keep your eyes on Israel. Much of future Bible prophecy is focused on the land and the people of Israel. Abram left Ur of Chaldees for the promised land that we now know to be Israel. In Genesis 12, 1 to 7, and 26, 1 to 5, the responsibility in God's directive will was, go not down to Egypt, but dwell, stay in the promised land. When a little test or famine came along, instead of trusting God to meet their needs, they went down into Egypt. And that was the failure of that age. It was the result of disobeying God's directive will. He allowed his permissive will, but they ended up in Egyptian bondage and slavery for hundreds of years. God heard the cry of the children of Israel in bondage to the Egyptians, so God raised up Moses to deliver them. And you may remember that event where the, God brought the plagues on Pharaoh and the Egyptians, 
the hail, the boils, the lice, swarms of flies, death of the Egyptian cattle and the rivers turning to blood. Some of these are going to be repeated uh, in, in like manner during the coming tribulation. We'll see more about that later. But they were down at the sea, ready to cross the sea, and of course they were trapped because the Egyptian armies were in hot pursuit. God told Moses, and Moses told the people, it's recorded in Exodus 14, 14, Stand still, the Lord shall fight for you. But of course, there was a wall of water on the right and a wall of water on the left, and the children of Israel went through, down between those walls, went through the sea on dry land. The Egyptians said, well, I guess we can do the same thing. They went right in after them. But remember, God had promised to fight for them, and we read in verse 25 that God caused the Egyptians' chariot wheels to come off out there in the middle of the Red Sea. And of course, Israel escaped, and the Egyptians were all trapped. Again, God demonstrated His love and grace by miraculously delivering Israel safely from their many years of Egyptian bondage on dry ground through the Red Sea. But with just, uh, within just a few days after the Red Sea crossing, the Israelites were complaining and not trusting God even for their daily food and water. So that brings us to age number five called law. God gave them the law. Now, please understand, it was not for salvation. It was to teach them and us that we are sinners and that God is holy. A good lesson to always remember is this. Shallow views of God and His holiness will produce shallow views of sin and the need for atonement. The Ten Commandments were part of that law. and The Ten Commandments are like a mirror. You know, you can look in a mirror and you can see that you've got a dirty face, but you don't take the mirror off the wall and wash your face. You need a separate cleansing agent like soap and water. As people try to keep the Ten Commandments, they learn they can't keep them. They break them, so it reveals their sin. You need a separate cleansing agent, and that can only be the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Galatians 3.24 says that the law was our schoolmaster, that is our teacher, to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. You can remember it this way very easily. The Ten Commandments teach only Christ can save. After Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, they finally got back to their promised land, which we now know to be Israel. The responsibility of that age was to keep all the law. And in Exodus 19.8, we read that they promised, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. However, they did not. They broke the law and went back into idolatry, worshiping false gods and false religions. When Christ was born near the end of age number five, they even failed to recognize Him as the promised Savior, even though they had Old Testament scriptures 700 years in advance of the birth of the Messiah, like Isaiah 7:14 that said He'd be born of a virgin. To help identify Christ, they still failed to recognize Him. John 1:11 says He came unto His own, that is, His own creation, His own people received Him not. And at the trial of Christ, Matthew 27, 22, Pilate asked the Jewish religious leaders, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Verse 23 says, The people cried out, Let him be crucified. And verse 25 records, All the people said, His blood be on us and on our children. They literally invited God's judgment, and it came. In AD 70, Titus destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, killed a million Jews, and the rest were scattered throughout the world. And as you know, in World War II, Hitler killed six million Jews. The judgment of age number five was the worldwide dispersion of the children of Israel. They nearly became extinct as a nation and as a race. Over 500 years before Christ, Ezekiel 36, verses 16 to 19, predicted the worldwide dispersion of Israel that started in A.D. 70. Over 500 years before Christ, that same chapter, verses 20 to 24, predicted the regathering of Israel. Now that prophecy has been filled in most of our lifetimes because on May the 14th, 1948, Israel became a new nation. Next, Ezekiel 36, 25 and Jeremiah 30 and 7 predicts for Israel the cleansing from their unbelief, which is one purpose of the coming seven-year tribulation judgment. Now again, God demonstrated His love and grace. He preserved a remnant of Israel through judgment, and He will yet keep His promises to them and bless the world through them. Now there are basically two parts to the law, the moral law, which we know as the Ten Commandments, and the ceremonial or the sacrificial part of the law. It's very important that Christ was born of a virgin because with His virgin birth, He did not inherit Adam's sin nature as we did and as we do, so Christ was sinless by birth. 
With his perfect life, Christ fulfilled the moral law, the Ten Commandments. With his sacrificial death on the cross, he fulfilled the ceremonial part of the law. Thus, with his life and death, he fulfilled all the law. When he said, it is finished, it literally means paid in full. Now, during age number five, the ceremonial or sacrificial part of the law was performed in the tabernacle in the wilderness and then later incorporated into the temple of Jerusalem. The tabernacle was a portable structure. They moved as God led them for 40 years from the Red Sea back to their promised land. Each item inside and outside the tabernacle had very significant functions. An important and interesting thing happened inside the temple when Christ died. The structure walls were 15 feet high. The most holy place was separated by a 15 foot high veil from the holy place. That veil separated man from God except once a year on the great day of atonement. The high priest entered through the veil into the most holy place with incense and blood for one more year of atonement for his sins and the people's sins. Now that veil barred all other access to God. Watch what happened to that veil that barred man's access to God on, except on the great day of atonement. When Christ died on the cross, Matthew 27, 51 says, that 15 foot high veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Man did not tear it. God ripped it. Access to God was no longer barred. The work of atonement was done, paid in full. Hebrews 9.12 says concerning Christ, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews 10.12 also says about Christ, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. He finished the work that God gave him to do. God was satisfied with Christ's death as the payment for our sins and proved it to the world by raising Christ from the dead. Again, God demonstrated his love and grace by sending Christ to die for our sins and by raising Christ from the dead, which proved his satisfaction in Christ's payment for us. The Holy Spirit began instantly and permanently indwelling the believers to equip them and empower them for Christian living. Next is about the grace or church age in which we're now living. This will also show visuals of many of the future events predicted to come on planet Earth. Number two is from the cross of Christ to the second coming of Christ. We're now living in age number six, grace or church age. The primary responsibility for people in this age is to receive Christ as their personal savior by faith. As in the past ages, this age will also end in failure. Most people are not trusting Christ alone for their salvation. As in the previous ages, the failure of this age will also bring judgment, the terrible seven-year tribulation times that Christ warned about when he was on the earth. This chart shows the pre-tribulation rapture, premillennial view long held by major fundamental Bible scholars, teachers, and schools. In Revelation 3.10, God promised to keep his believers from the hour, even the very time, of the worldwide testing and judgments to come and that's referring to the tribulation. Therefore, it's believed God will demonstrate His love and grace for the church by the rapture and remove His grace age believers out of the world before the tribulation. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, it says the dead in Christ will rise first, then the living in Christ will be caught up, and that's where we get our word rapture, with them to meet Christ in the air. At the rapture, Christ will suddenly appear in the clouds he will not come clear down to earth at this time. The event of the rapture will happen so fast, the world will be caught by surprise, and most people will be unprepared. The rapture will be good news for the saved people, but it will be bad news for the lost. 1 Corinthians 15.52 says, It will be sudden, in the twinkling of an eye. It will also be a separation of saved people from unsaved people. 
Remember the Bible said the dead in Christ shall rise first? This is part of that rapture picture showing a family being resurrected, but one member is not being taken. Why? Because only the dead in Christ will be taken. Only those that have put their total trust in Christ. Not just church members, not just baptized, but having put their total faith and trust in Christ. Now this rapture picture with the plane crash into the skyscraper was painted in 1974, 27 years before the fall of the New York City Twin Towers. When the rapture does occur, there may be many airline crashes if the pilot and co-pilot are both Christians and both suddenly gone. If you're seeing this and you're not saved, you should put your total trust in Jesus Christ immediately. Remember the coming rapture will be sudden and a separation of the saved people and the unsaved people. And the highways won't be any safer than being in an airplane. I had the artist paint my wife and I coming out of my vehicle at that time because I don't believe God's going to say to me, okay, Leon, it's time to go. Park your car on the side of the road. Just imagine how the highways are going to be with thousands of wrecks with driverless vehicles. With all the born-again Christian drivers suddenly gone, there, be ma there may be massive disasters on the highways. Now, no one knows when the rapture will come. There are no signs to happen before the rapture. The saved people could meet Christ in the air at any time. He could come at night while we're asleep. We'd simply go to bed and wake up in the presence of the Lord, and I think most of you believers would agree that would be a great way to go. Unsaved people would have no time to get right with God. They'd simply wake up and find their saved loved ones gone. The newspaper headlines may be uh, screaming the next day, multitudes missing, disaster strikes the earth, hundreds of wrecks, drivers missing, police unable to control the mobs and the looting, panic and terror worldwide. Now the rapture and tribulation could be sooner than we think. It would be very foolish for anyone not to heed the warnings of God's word. Those who reject Christ to the rapture may not have another opportunity for salvation during the tribulation. Here's why. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12 says, Many who hear, understand, and reject Christ now, that is, they heard the gospel, the Holy Spirit convicted them, they understood it, and they willfully rejected Christ, they will have strong delusion come on them during the tribulation. They'll believe the Antichrist lie. It'll seem logical to them. They'll take his mark and worship him and be eternally doomed. Now, Revelation 7, 1 to 8, and verse 14 does tell us there's going to be people saved during the tribulation. For example, there'll be 144,000 Jewish people saved, sealed, and protected during the tribulation. They'll be God's servants, possibly His preachers during that time. Again, God will demonstrate His love and grace by saving and protecting a remnant of Israel in the tribulation to be His servants during that tribulation time. Revelation chapter 11 tells about two special witnesses God will bring on the scene, and He will empower to empower them to preach on the earth for three and a half years, half of that seven years. The Antichrist will kill them. Their bodies will lay in Jerusalem dead in the streets for three and a half days. The whole world will see that. We've wondered how. It's probably now we can understand by satellite television. And the world will watch as they come back to life and ascend back up into heaven. And then Revelation 14, 6 to, uh, through 9 says that angels will fly over the earth preaching. And one's going to be warning, fear the God of creation and worship Him. So there's going to be a lot of preaching on earth during the tribulation. Revelation 7, 9 to 17 says a great number from all nations will be saved during the tribulation. But remember, not those who understood the gospel willfully rejected Christ before the rapture. Now it won't be easy for the believers who are saved during the tribulation. Revelation 20 and 4 says many, if not most, of the tribulation believers will be beheaded for refusing to take the Antichrist mark and worshiping him. Apparently the, the guillotine is going to be used again for public execution to create terror and submission to the Antichrist. Now when Christ was on the earth, he told us much about the coming tribulation events. He was asked when these events would come. In Matthew 24, 36, he said, No one knows except the Father. So beware of anyone setting dates. And I'm certainly not going to set any dates myself. Jesus did tell some conditions to precede his return at the end of the tribulation. We can't know when, but we can know much about what will happen. Watch world events. The stage may be setting now. Let's look at three stages to watch. World food famine, immorality and lawlessness, and a one world economic and monetary system. Stage number one, major global food famines are coming. 
In fact, Matthew 24, 7, Christ himself warned about the famines that will be coming during that time. And Revelation 6, 8 says that one-fourth, over one-fourth of the world's population will die from the war, the hunger, and the wild beasts of the earth, which I assume will be attacking humans because of their hunger. Now, is there any evidence for coming food famine? U.S. News and World Report, January 28, 1974, page 50 said, in 1974, the United States committed its last major reserve of 50 million acres for food production. There's simply no other large parcels of land available and suitable for food production. 20 years later, a web story said, Despite bumper harvest, world's cupboard grows bare. World's grain harvest have for four years fallen short of consumption. And two years later, the USDA lowered the amount it forecast for global wheat and corn production due to partly to drought in Australia, putting world wheat stockpiles at their lowest in 25 years. Now look at this. World population doubled from 2 billion in 1927 to 4 billion in 1975, and it's calculated and predicted to double again from 4 billion to 8 billion by 2025. So you can see the stage is set for global food famine during the tribulation. Stage number two, immorality and lawlessness. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13 tells us that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Evil men and seducers shall get worse and worse. Question, has morality gotten better or worse in the last 50 years? For example, in the public, in movies, on television. Well, I think you know the answer to that. Do our U.S. governments and courts still honor God and His Word like the Ten Commandments as they did, say, 50 years ago? What about our public schools and colleges, many of which were founded on Christian principles? Do they still honor God and His Word as they did 50 years ago, even 20 years ago? And I think you know the answer to that. Immorality has changed. Public honor for God and His Word has changed. What about lawlessness? Has it increased or decreased during the last 50 years? Is crime up or down? Here's data from the U.S. Department of Justice. And it said that many crimes, like drug-related, are up. Revelation 9, 20 and 21 says that during the tribulation, those people, uh, the unsaved people, will not repent of their worship of devils and idols. Unrestrained, neither will they repent of their murders, drugs, immorality, and thefts. So, number one, famine is predicted, and it appears the stage is being set. Number two, immorality and lawlessness are getting worse, and the Bible says that will increase. Number three, a one-world economic system. In Revelation 13, 5, 16 and 17, we read that for 42 months, half of that seven-year tribulation, the Antichrist will cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now, why will he require that mark? Verse 17, that no man might buy or sell unless he has the Antichrist mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Without the Antichrist mark, people won't be able to buy or sell anything, food, gas, electricity, nothing. By controlling world trade, the Antichrist will demand the worship of the world. Now, many unsaved people will take that Antichrist mark and worship him, and Revelation 14, 9-11 promises their eternal doom, eternity in the lake of fire. Now, are there any indications that a one-world economic, monetary, and banking system may be getting set up yet? Here are some possibilities. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, is an international organization of many member countries. It was established, quote, to promote international monetary cooperation. Euro dollars are becoming very popular. In 1972, there were 11 billion, 1981, 178 billion, 1991, 429 billion. Could the IMF and the Euro dollars be part of a one world monetary system required by the Antichrist during the tribulation? Here's another thing. Millions of high-speed computers are already set up. They can scan UPC codes, and they can help link up a one-world economic and monetary system. What's next? Perhaps a UPC code or a chip to be implanted in humans for ID for the global monetary system needed by the Antichrist in the Tribulation? Tiny chips the size of a grain of rice with RFID, radio frequency ID, electronic technology are already being used to track merchandise, sales information, and for inventory control. Being tiny, they're already being implanted under pets' skins for ID. How about with humans for ID, or medical information, or for a cashless society? Now, understand, please, there's nothing wrong with our modern computer technology. It can be used now for good and for God's glory. It's just that the Antichrist may take it over during the tribulation for his one-world economic control system and worship. 
So the impending food famines, the worsening immorality and lawlessness in the coming one world economic system are all in harmony with the scriptures for the tribulation. Now, about the tribulation. After the rapture, some world leader will establish a peace treaty between Israel and her enemies, and that will officially begin the seven-year tribulation. The Antichrist will break that peace treaty in the middle of the seven years and move into the rebuilt Jewish temple in Jerusalem. During this last half, he'll claim to be God, demanding the worship of the world. Now this chart shows the tribulation judgments. There are three, three sets of seven judgments each. The following information is content only, not sequence or necessarily time of occurrence. Let's see more about each of the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments, and the battle of Armageddon. When we see this beautiful planet Earth hanging out here in space, I'll have to agree it's almost hard to believe what God says is going to happen during the seven year tribulation, but it's His word. You can be sure it's going to happen. And don't take my word for this. Please read about this in your own Bible. And we'll give you the scripture references where you can do that. There's going to be a massive earthquake. The sun will become blood. The moon will become as as uh, the the sun will become black, and the moon will become as blood. And the stars of heaven will fall to the earth like a fig tree dropping its frigs when it gets shaken. Every mountain and island will be moved out of their places, possibly due to the great earthquakes. Can you imagine the beautiful mountains of this world being destroyed? God's word warns that the tribulation will be so bad, people will beg the mountains and rocks to fall on them and hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. And they're going to say, quote, For the great day of His wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Now the seal judgments are all recorded in Revelation chapter 6, and you can read about them there. Verse 4, world peace will be taken, there will be war, and the use of a great weapon. Verses 5 and 6 tells us about the famine that's coming. When a day's wages will be required for a quart of wheat, about enough to make a loaf of bread, I don't know how they'll get their other food, I don't know how they'll pay their other bills. And then verse 8 says, one-fourth of the world's population, one-fourth, will die from the war and the hunger. Keep that figure in mind. Chapter 6, verses 9 to 11 tells about the tribulation believers that are going to be slain, beheaded during that time. Verses 12 and 13 tells about the earthquakes, the sun will become dark, the, the stars will fall from the heavens. And verse 14 tells us every mountain and island will be moved out of their places. And then 15 to 17 describes the panic and the terror that's going to be worldwide, universal during that time. Now the seven trumpet judgments get more severe. Now folks, these visuals are to help us realize that these are real events that will come on a real day to real people living on this planet Earth. Hail and fire mingled with blood is going to fall. Great death in the seas, many will die from the bloody, bitter waters in the seas, rivers, and springs because a great mountain or meteorite is going to fall into these waters. The trumpet judgments are recorded as follows. Chapter 8, verse 7, hail and fire mingled with blood will fall. 8 and 9, the burning mountain into the sea, a third of the sea will become blood, a third in the sea will die, a third of the ships will be destroyed, and probably their crews. Chapter 8, verses 10 to 11, a great burning star will fall into the rivers and fresh water sources. Many will die from those bitter, poison, polluted waters. Chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 12, one-third of the sun, moon and stars will be smitten. Think of that, one-third of the sun, one-third of the sun's heat will be lost. Think what that will do to agriculture and increasing the severity of food famines, possibly. Chapter 9, verses 1 to 11, tells about the demonic creatures that are going to be released to torture the unsaved people of the earth for five months. Verses 13 to 18 tells about a 200 million man army and another one-third of the world's population is going to die. Previously we had a fourth, now we've got a third. That's over half the world's population so far is going to die during the tribulation. And then chapter 11, verses 13 and 19 tell about more great earthquakes and more great hail. Now, you'll notice that these next bowl judgments are even more severe than were the seal and trumpet judgments. Grievous sores, boils, are going to be poured out upon those who wear the mark of the Antichrist. This time, all in the sea is going to become blood. All in the sea is going to die. Can you imagine everything in the sea dying? All the fish dead, all the ships and crews destroyed, all the worldwide pollution, diseases, and death, just from this one judgment alone. And then God says, all fresh water will become blood. Those who rejected Christ's blood to pay for their sins and those who killed the Christians will have nothing but blood to drink. The sun will be affected and cause men to be scorched with fire and great heat. Now some scientists have related nuclear fusion as like harnessing the power of the sun. Could it be? 
there is an Old Testament prophecy that many people believe may describe the possible fuse, future use of nuclear weapons. Here it is. Zechariah 14, 12. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. Now folks, that happened in World War II when atomic bombs were used. It may happen again during the tribulation. This is the beautiful valley of Megiddo, about 50 miles north of Jerusalem. And it's believed to be the place where the battle of Armageddon will occur. Revelation 14.20 says the blood will run up to four feet deep for 176 miles. The bowl judgments are all recorded in Revelation chapter 16, and you can read about them there. Verse 2, the grievous sores that are going to plague the unsaved people. Verse 3, when the sea will become blood, all in the sea will die. Verses 4 to 6, all the fresh water is going to be turned to blood. Verses 8 and 9, the men will be scorched with the great fire and heat out of heaven. Verses 10 to 11, the men will gnaw out their tongues because of the pain, but they still won't repent. And verses 12 to 16, the Euphrates River is going to dry up for an invasion from the kings of the east. That may be the 200, 200 million man army predicted in Revelation 9, 16. That's an invasion of Israel, by the way. Verse 18, the greatest earthquake since people have been on the earth. Verse 19, Jerusalem will be divided into three parts, and get this, the other cities of the nations will fall. Verse 20, every island and mountain will disappear. Previously, they were moved, now they will disappear. Now, this is about the size of a 100-pound block of ice, for many of you that perhaps have never seen one. I did an internet search and found that the largest hailstones that have ever been recorded having fallen on the earth was less than two pounds. Revelation 16 21 says during the tribulation the hailstones are going to be the weight of a talent which is about a hundred pounds per hailstone. No wonder Jesus warned in Matthew 24 21 that these would be the worst judgments ever on earth past or future. Now the events at the end of the tribulation Revelation 19 11 to 16 tells about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth in his glory. And that same chapter, 11 to 21, tells about the conclusion of the battle of Armageddon. Christ himself will stop it. Again, God will demonstrate his love and grace by Christ personally stopping the tribulation judgments before all the human race on earth is killed. Verse 20, the Antichrist will be cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And verse 21, the remnant will be slain. That is, the unsaved who followed the Antichrist and survived the tribulation, they will be slain. After all the bad news about the tribulation judgments, how about some good news? The tribulation will end with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to earth in His glory. The Bible says, when He comes, His countenance will be as the sun shining in its full strength. Revelation 1.16 Christ's return is going to be one of the most historic and dramatic events ever on earth or in heaven. Next, We'll see more visuals about the future events, such as the final judgments, the horrors of hell, and the beauties of heaven. Section number three is from the second coming of Christ to eternity future. This is a beautiful sunset photo of Jerusalem as seen from the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. This is the same place where Jesus prayed and later ascended back up into heaven. And it's where he will return to this earth in his glory. Zechariah 14.4 says, His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. In AD 33, Jesus entered Jerusalem through this eastern gate to present himself as the king to come as predicted in 487 B.C. It was the day of his triumphal entry. He came into Jerusalem on the young colt of a donkey, exactly as predicted 500 years before in Zechariah 9.9. And yet, even with that specific Old Testament prophecy, the religious leaders failed to recognize him as the promised Messiah, and they rejected him. The Turks sealed this gate in 1530 A.D. Ezekiel 44, 2 and 3 says this gate will stay sealed until the Prince, that is the Messiah, returns and enters Jerusalem. In the 1967 Six-Day War, 
Israeli troops almost crashed through this eastern gate, but for some reason they went to another gate instead. So this gate is still sealed shut. And we who have visited Jerusalem have seen this eastern gate still sealed shut to this day. Jesus Christ will re-enter Jerusalem through this gate to rule the world for the 1,000 year millennium. When Christ returns in His great glory, He will establish His 1,000 year millennium or kingdom rule on earth. And that's this final dispensation. Now it's called kingdom. Uh, it's the final dispensational test of man. Israel will be restored with the right relationship to God and the promises He made to her down through the ages. Now we've seen six tests so far. In innocence, they failed God. In number two, conscience, we learned that conscience is insufficient to bring people to a right relationship with God. Human government is inadequate to bring people to a right relationship to God. And even when given a specific promise, conditional promise, they disobeyed. Under law, they promised to keep it, but they did not. They broke it. And in the age of grace, fully demonstrated by the coming and death and resurrection of Christ, most people are still rejecting Him as their Savior. Now please understand, there has always been, and there still are, millions of wonderful people in the world today. We all have many nice friends we like, even love. They're really good people. Now we may be good people by man's standards, but by God's standards, all of us are sinners. And no one will ever be in God's holy heaven unless we meet His terms for our salvation. To help set up conditions for this final test and show that people cannot be saved apart from God's grace, Satan will be taken out of operation on the earth for 1,000 years. People won't be able to say, Oh, I could have made it, if it on my own if it hadn't been for the devil. Revelation 20, 1-3 says Satan will be cast into a bottomless pit for the 1,000 years. So he cannot roam earth and influence the minds of men. It's going to be wonderful during that age. Uh, here are some descriptions of that time. Isaiah 11, 3-5 says, Christ will rule the world with righteousness. He'll smite any outbreak of sin with His mouth and slay the wicked with His breath. Isaiah 11, 9 says, the earth, we the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. In chapter 2, verses 1-3, to people will learn of and walk in the ways of the Lord. Isaiah 2.4, people will beat their weapons into tools for agriculture. Nations will live in peace. Neither shall they learn war anymore. And here's an interesting verse. Isaiah 11, 6 to 8 The wolf and the lamb, the leopard and the kid, the calf and the lion, the cow and the bear will lie down together. They'll dwell together. The lion will eat straw like an ox, and a little child shall lead them. Isaiah 35, 1-10 says, Even the wilderness will be glad about the return of Christ, and the desert will bloom like a rose. Matthew 25, 31-46, the believers who survive the tribulation will enter the millennium. The final test is for their children who are born in this age and live in their natural bodies on earth. The responsibility is for them to obey and worship Christ. Millions will worship Him, but the test shows that natural man still has a sinful heart. Failure is revealed when Satan is released at the end of the thousand years. Revelation 20 and 8 informs us that he will deceive millions of people all over the world. Verse 8 and 9 adds that Satan will gather a huge army of rebels, that is the unbelieving, unsaved, fake worshipers of Christ, who will unite for battle against God's people at Jerusalem. Now concerning that huge army of rebels, rebels uh, Revelation 9, 20 and 9 says that fire will come down from God out of heaven and devour them. Verse 10 of that same chapter says Satan's final judgment will be when he will cast into the lake of fire and brimstone to be tormented day and night forever. At the end of age number 7, kingdom, will come the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, 11 and 15 says God's books will be opened. The final books of the great white throne. Specifically, let's see three things. Who will be judged, what the books are, and the result of this final judgment. First, who will be judged? To understand that, we need to understand the resurrections. There are basically two resurrections, that of the saved and the unsaved. Now, the resurrection of the saved is in three parts. 
many of the bodies of the Old Testament saints which slept rose with Christ when He was resurrected. The dead and living in Christ of this age will be resurrected at the rapture and the believers who are saved and beheaded during the tribulation will be resurrected at the end of that tribulation. Again, God demonstrated His love and grace by promising to resurrect all who have put their total trust in Christ for salvation down through the ages. Now, the resurrection of the tribulation believers uh, at, the end of the, is, at the end of the tribulation is the end of the first resurrection, the end of the resurrection of the saved. Revelation 20 and 5 says, The rest of the dead, that is all the unsaved dead, will not live again until the thousand years is finished. So who will be judged at the white throne? The unsaved of all ages will be resurrected to stand before God at the white throne judgment. Believers will not be judged here. Scriptures like Romans 8, 1 and John 5, 24 promise no condemnation and no future judgment for salvation for those in Christ. Again, God demonstrated His love and grace by assuring us in His Word that we believers are completely safe in Christ from future judgment for salvation. Now let's see what the five books are that may be used to judge the unsaved at the great white throne judgment. Again, this is content only, may not be opened in this sequence. Book number one, God's Word will be a witness against all the unsaved at their judgment. Now, they may have said, I don't believe the Bible. Well, they will, they will one day at the white throne. And in the meantime, their rejection has been recorded. John 12, 48 records that Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. The scriptures that unsaved people rejected whether they read them in the Bible or a gospel tract, heard them spoken, or even on radio and TV, those scriptures rejected will testify against them before Christ at the white throne judgment. Book number two, The Secrets of the Unsaved People. Romans 2, 15 to 16 says, The secrets of the unsaved will accuse them in the day of judgment. That could be both actions and thoughts. Every time lost men looked on women with lust, or lost teenagers had bad thoughts about their parents or their teachers, God knew all about it. God is watching and hearing even our thoughts. Psalms 94.11 says, The Lord knows the thoughts of men. Proverbs 15.26 reveals, The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord. Every time unsaved people even thought, I don't believe all this junk about heaven, hell, and Christ, God knew their unbelief. Those very thoughts will accuse them as guilty before God. Book number three, words. Matthew 12, 36 records Christ's warning about this. I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Now every idle word may be every evil word, every dirty joke, every curse word. God heard them. The sinful words spoken by unsafe people will testify against them in their day of judgment. Have you noticed people cussing and swearing using the name of Jesus Christ? They don't swear by any other well-known name like Abraham, Noah, Stalin, Hitler, or even Satan. Exodus 20 and 7 says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now oh, I know many times people think it's smart or funny to take the holy name of Jesus Christ in vain, cursing and swearing. But God heard them, and their own words will prove them guilty. Book number four, works. Revelation 20 and 12, John wrote, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. The recorded works of the resurrected unsaved dead will witness against them. Every rejection of the gospel may be revealed at the white throne and may also be a memory in hell forever for those people. Lying, stealing, cheating on exams and income taxes, shoplifting when they thought nobody was watching, dope, drunkenness, disobedience to parents, law-breaking, sex outside of marriage they thought nobody else knew about, profanity, even pride. Every sin unsafe people thought they got by with may be revealed at the white throne. 
Now we've seen who will be judged at the white throne, the unsaved of all the ages. We've seen what four of the five books are, God's word rejected, the sinful thoughts of the lost, the ungodly words of the lost, and the works of the unsaved. Now let's see the fifth book in the end result of the great white throne judgment. Book number five, the book of life. Revelation 20 and 15 tells us, Whosoever will not be found written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. The names of the unsaved people will simply not be there. In Revelation 20, 14, John wrote, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now let's clarify an important truth about this great white throne judgment. People won't be in hell due to what these books reveal. The books just confirm their guilt of sin against God. Christ's death has already paid for all sin. 1 John 2, 2 says He is the propitiation, that is the satisfactory payment, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Again, God demonstrated His love and grace to us by His gift of salvation, offered to the human race, and fully paid for by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. People will only be in hell because they did not trust Christ's death his shed blood as the only acceptable payment for their sins. The final result of the great white throne judgment, all the unsaved people will be separated from God forever in the lake of fire. After the white throne, earth as we now know it will be destroyed and will pass away. There will be a new heaven and a new earth, the eternal dwelling place of all saved people with the Lord forever. Now during the seven ages, we've seen seven tests, seven failures, and seven divine judgments. However, in all seven ages, many people did believe God's word. They did trust and obey Him. What was God's overall purpose and plan of the ages? We mentioned that at the very beginning that we would tell you what that is. God was gathering out a people for His name, for an eternal possession, for His glory forever in heaven. Now the story is told about a stone cutter, a worker in marble, who was walking through a cemetery one day and on a tombstone he saw these words, All you people passing by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you must be. Prepare for death and follow me. The stone cutter took his hammer and chisel and added these words, To follow you I will not consent until I know which way you went. A question that many people don't want to talk about is, after death, then what? You know, we're not really fully prepared to enjoy life until we're saved and no longer fear death. For us, the saved, death is just our graduation to heaven. A common question is, when saved people die, will they really live again in heaven in a body? Yes. 1 Corinthians 15, 44 says, there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Paul wrote, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Romans 8, 11 says, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. And notice he said, shall. It's a definite promise. Question, is heaven a real place or just a state of mind? Many people think heaven or hell is just here on earth. Well, let's see what Jesus said about that. In John 14, 2 and 3, Jesus said, In my Father's house and many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, and notice he said twice that it's a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus said the saved will dwell with him in a real place literal place that He has prepared. So heaven is a real literal place, the eternal dwelling place of all saved people with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it'll be a wonderful place with the Lord and millions of happy saved people. Revelation 21, 4 says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Death will be gone. Neither sorrow, nor crying, 
neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Did you get that? Death, crying, pain will be gone forever. Can you imagine the joy of arriving in heaven, being greeted by our saved loved ones and the Lord Jesus Christ himself? 1 Peter 1.4 says, God has promised us an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Notice this. It's already reserved for the believers. Now, do you realize how wonderful heaven will be? Better than anything we've ever seen, better than anything we've ever heard, better than anything we've ever even imagined. 1 Corinthians 2 9 says, Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Eternity with Christ will be beautiful beyond description, including the music. Revelation 5 9 to 12 tells us that 10,000 times 10,000 plus thousands of thousands, that number can't even be calculated, will be singing praise to Christ. In one of the songs, Thou was slain and has redeemed us by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. According to Revelation 21, 16 to 27, one city, the New Jerusalem, will be 1,300 miles square. That's about half the size of the United States. And its beauty will be like jewels, clean and bright. The light of the sun and the moon will not be needed because the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ will be the light and there will be no night there and no more sin forever. Can you imagine heaven's beauty being even more fantastic than God's creations on the earth? Like the beautiful lakes, such as Crater Lake in Oregon? The gorgeous flowers that God's given us to enhance our landscapes? The magnificent mountains like the Grand Tetons in Wyoming? Yes, heaven will be more beautiful than anything we've ever seen on earth. How incredible it's going to be to be there with all of our saved loved ones and the Lord Jesus Christ himself. However, to more fully appreciate the many joys of eternity in heaven, we need to consider what it will be like for the multitudes of people in eternity without Christ. Can you imagine the horror of plunging into hell with all the lost souls and Satan himself? Hell is a real literal place, not just a state of mind. Mark 9, 45, Jesus himself said, It's a fire that shall not be quenched. Luke 16 to 24, a man in hell confirmed that there is torment and flame. And Revelation 14, 10 and 11 also warns its torment with flame and no rest day or night. Matthew 25, 41 tells us that hell was initially prepared for the devil and his angels, but the people who die in their sins, having rejected Christ, will have to spend eternity in hell with Satan, separated from God forever. Eternity without Christ will be miserable, absolutely horrible. Hell will echo with the cries of the lost. Have mercy, water, but it will be too late. The Bible guarantees eternal judgment for the lost. In Matthew 23, 33, Jesus warned lost people, including religious lost people, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Again, God demonstrated His love and grace by warning us in the...